Gentlemen, please welcome VP Cloud Architecture, Amazon Web Services, Adrian Cockcroft. Oh. Cool, this is awesome. Um, welcome everybody to the New York Summit. Uh, this is an amazing event. It's great to have over 20,000 people sign up for it and we're also live streaming today. Now this isn't just a, a talk from, from me to you, it, there's an awful lot going on. We have 101 technical sessions, 101 partner solutions, and this is an educational event. What we, what we, the way we like to think about it, everyone at AWS and all of you, you're builders, you're building things out of all of the components that we put together. Some of you are new to AWS, there's people in the audience that have maybe been using AWS for a decade. So talk to your friends, talk to the people around you, talk to everybody out in the hub. And today's a, an opportunity for people to really figure out how to use this and all the new kinds of things that we're doing. So I'm going to start off with a quick update on the business. And one of the things, when, when I first started using AWS in 2009, we had this question, is AWS going to be big enough to run a large business, online business? Is it going to scale enough, and is it going to grow with us? Well, I think it has. We're now at a $16 billion run rate. The last quarter, we did $4.1 billion of business, and we're growing 42% year on year. We are running some of the largest companies in the world, and it's giving us uh, a, a really good ability to make it feel to you that you're a small fish in a big pond and the elasticity that comes of being in a really, really large environment. It also gives us a great level of investment that we can put into building new products. Gartner, once again, lists us as a leader in the Gartner Quadrant for Cloud Infrastructure as a Service Worldwide. Yeah, this, this chart doesn't change very much year to year. We're the top right dot. And what that's giving us is millions of active customers every month. We're very proud and, and privileged to have many of you and just millions around the world of customers and businesses running on AWS. So I'm going to go through a few of those customers right now and uh, show you a few logos. We have just an enormous number of startup customers. And I'm just going to pick out one of the local ones from uh, this area. In Brooklyn, there's a, a media-based startup called Bustle. They focus on creating content for millennial women. And they're an early adopter of AWS Lambda. We're seeing this with a lot of uh, startups now. They're, they're going serverless from the outset. And Bustle think they, uh, they, they saved 
approximately 84% of their costs by using serverless and by using AWS Lambda as their architecture to build out their entire web experience. So that's what's going on with startups. Enterprises, we have just about everybody on AWS. We pick out another local customer, Dunking Brands. They've been running their mobile experience on AWS. They've migrated it. They've got a much better digital experience for everybody. And they've got increased scalability, reliability, availability, security, and all while they were reducing costs. So this is typical. There's a lot of this going on. We see many organizations, many enterprises moving their, you know, quite often mobile first, but then more and more of their greenfield applications, and then more migrating entire, uh, entire fleets of applications as they start to close down data centers. So we'll talk more about that later. We have, again, lots of public sector customers. I'm going to pick out one, one really interesting one that's uh, local here. Uh, FINRA, Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, something that uh, Wall Street has to watch out for. They're tracking what's going on in the markets. And in a typical day, they're processing 37 billion records about all the different trades that are going on. And they've moved 90% of their data volumes to AWS. And you know when there's a market correction, the, the volume on the market spikes as well. They're able to fire up additional capacity whenever they need to, to stay on top of whatever they need to, whatever they need to regulate. Now, one of the problems that I hear from our customers, the big enterprise customers that migrating, is they say, where do I get the people? How do I find how to migrate to AWS? Well, we have our own professional services people, and there is obviously a lot of people out there that are trained in AWS. But if you're a multinational corporation, you're probably working already with one of the large systems integrators, one of the big global systems integrators. And we've been working very well with them to build out their consulting practices. And they're, they're getting a lot of experience. You can, if you bring them in, they've done this many times before. They know how to get this done. And then we've got lots of smaller organizations helping out. They are uh, in vertical markets for very specific areas, and they're in, in uh, certain geographies. So, there's, there's a, a, a huge range here, something for everybody, and we're very proud that we've built this uh, really broad range of uh, consulting partners. And then ISVs. There's really too many ISVs to list, and this is really becoming, in a sense, a problem, right? Okay, I need, I need, a, I need a product to solve a problem. Try guess some brand names, but it's getting to be um, that you really need, we needed to give you some help here. So the AWS marketplace is becoming an increasingly common place where people go and find out like, what are all the solutions for doing a solving a particular problem. We've got 135,000 active customers working in the marketplace. There's 1,200 ISVs already participating in it, and 3,800 more uh, listings. So if you're an ISV and you're not already in the marketplace, you should really get in there. This is turning into an extremely powerful way for the customers to get connected and see all the different solutions. Particularly if you're a startup and, you know, how do you get known? Well, you can get in there, and if you get the right keywords, they'll find you and they'll see you alongside all the other opportunity, all the other um, solutions in that space. So where are we? Um, in 2014, AWS at the reInvent, we were talking about the new normal. And that was because we saw we saw enterprises starting greenfield applications on AWS as just, that's the default, that's what everyone did. And they were migrating more and more applications to AWS. The following year, we, we really dug in a bit, why has it become the new normal? It's because we gave you control of your own destiny. You're able to use things as you want to use them. You pay just for what you use. You, there's no complicated, long, uh, proof of concept cycles. The, if you want to try something out, it's right there. There's probably even a free tier for you to learn it and play around with it. It's a hugely different game from the old sort of data center world where when you want to do something, it's a long discussion, it's a lot of installation, and it takes forever just to figure out whether something's going to work for you. So the ability to experiment live 
on, on, in the same systems that you're running in production just because it's just, you know, your test account is just another AWS account. This is one of the most exciting things that we've been, the biggest changes that we've been making. And what we're doing by giving you all of these capabilities, not just infrastructure, but services above it, we think we're giving you superpowers. We want to be like you know, Q for your James Bond, giving you all the different powers. Here's the kit bag. Here's all of the different tools. Here's that fast car with all of the extra buttons you can push to make things happen. So I'm going to go through and tell you some of these superpowers, and uh, we'll sort of organize the, the rest of the event around these. Now, first reason people move to cloud is speed. It takes weeks to months to get machines provisioned. Just, just that one thing. You know, I, so many people just, just spending forever just trying to get something provisioned. And once you've provisioned it, you want to hang on to it because it took you so long to get it, you're not going to give it back. So you end up with these very locked down systems running very efficient, inefficiently because you've got it sitting there and you're not going to give it back even though it's idle because you might need it again next week. Now, if you'd move to a world where you can get stuff immediately in, in seconds or minutes, then you give it back because you can get it again in a few seconds or minutes. It gets much more flexible. It's much more dynamic, much more elastic. And it saves huge amounts of time for businesses as you're trying to get things done, as you're trying to get more competitive in the market. So that, that's the first thing. The other thing is on top of that is the time it takes to just use all the capabilities and build them. Instead of going and installing all of these additional packages and services, you can just use the ones that are there, they're at scale, and they're ready to go. And the pace of innovation that we've been maintaining has been increasing. You know, I, I mentioned we're growing fast, we're a large organization now. What that gives us is the ability to invest in engineering, and you can see we have pretty much an exponential growth in the number of features and services that we're releasing. This is the, the, an incredible power that uh, AWS brings. It's one of the reasons I joined AWS. There was just so much going on. I joined a little over, uh, just under a year ago. And it's in a, such a broad domain. There's compute, analytics, there's mobile, there's gaming, there's all kinds of things. Today, I think we're going to focus mostly around the enterprise migration space. Um, but let's just see. There, there's an enormous number of things here. We tried to fit them all on one shot. It's a bit of an eye chart. Um, there'll be a test later, I guess. <laughs> um, I'm just going to focus in on a few of these. We don't just have a service. We have really deep functionality in each service. If you look at compute, we have a lot of different instance types. If it, databases, we have a broader range of database options than anyone, a, any of the other providers. And the security and access, we go really deep. Uh, really important things like bringing your own key for security and uh, the, all the compliance that you need across, around the world in all the different markets. So we'll look a bit more at that later as well. Let's drill in on compute. This is one of my favorite slides. We have all of these cool things here, and you can just fire one up and try it out. Light sail. Okay. There's too much stuff here. It's too complicated. I just wanted an instance, and I wanted to know how much it was going to cost every month to run WordPress or something like that. That's what LightSail is. It's got its own console. It's very easy to get started. It's a great on-ramp for people that don't want to deal with all the complexities and, and, and all of the different 90 or more services that we have. They just want to stand something up. So that's why we have LightSail. It runs on the T2 instance type. And then as you go across here, you see a wide variety of, of storage, compute, mixtures of uh, different cap capabilities. I'm going to pick out a couple of them. X1, large memory. What does large memory mean? Um, try going into your, if, you're, if you have an on-premise data center environment, go to your ops people and say, I'd like a machine with two terabytes of RAM just to play around with for a few hours. It's not really going to get a great, that's not going to be a great conversation. <laughs> people don't have those things lying around. Well, we do. It's just an instance type. You can get it by the hour. Um, and we've actually announced, so that's the X1. Uh, originally working with SAP for running SAP HANA, that's sort of its initial sort of primary reason for existence, but you can use it to run anything. You know, huge graph databases, uh, incredible in-memory analytics capabilities, anything you want that fits in enormous amounts of memory. 
And we announced a few months ago that we're, we're increasing it soon to four terabytes. And next year, we'll go to eight, maybe 16. This is an incredible amount of memory. I'm just fascinated to see what people do when you give them you know, eight to 16 terabytes of memory to play with. But I'm going to drill a little bit on, on the last one here, the F1, FPGAs. Few programmable gate arrays. OK, this is a bit deep. Um, any hardware designers in the audience? It's not really this crowd, is it, probably? Anyway, if you can find people that know how to program hardware, that, that design hardware, they're, they're hard to find. It's a pretty specialized uh, uh, business at this point. But you can go incredibly fast when you design a custom chip to do something. And it's been difficult to install. It's been difficult to build. It's been difficult to deploy. But we've changed all that with the F1 instance type. There's a pretty straightforward pipeline. You develop, simulate, debug, and compile your code on AWS. You make sure everything's done. There's, that's a, you know, design what your, float, what your uh, code process is going to look like. Then you package it as an FPA image. It's so, a bit like a, a machine image, an Amazon machine image, but it, it programs the FPGA to configure it into a certain way, a certain architecture. And then you deploy that. And we're, we're working towards getting these things. As we build out a number of these, we want to have these, uh, build a marketplace around these. So you'll be able to just use off-the-shelf things. We're not quite there. We're still rolling it out. The FPGA instance is now GA, but uh, we're still working on the marketplace piece. But here's some use cases. Genomics research, financial analytics. If you want to be able to do your analytics a bit faster than everybody else, that quite often makes a big difference. Real-time video processing. We've seen 30x speed-ups, 30 times faster using a dedicated processor to process real-time live video than doing it using conventional methods. And big data search and analytics. So what we see is we have customers leveraging this to achieve supersonic speed. Customers going so fast that they can build new applications. And it's sometimes these are uh, big enterprises just trying to catch up with, uh, with startups in this space. And sometimes it's the startups themselves getting out ahead. So for example, uh, Robin Hood, a startup offering no fees security trading. They used AWS to create a massively scalable securities trading app with strong built-in security and compliance features. And they supported hundreds of thousands of users at launch. And they did that with two developers, two. So if two developers can build something like that, what could you do? Now, I've got uh, an announcement now. There's uh, a really happy that we have a new logo to add to our customer list. Um, this is going out today as, a, as an announcement, but we have Hulu for the first time moving to AWS. And I'd like to um, invite Rafael Soltanovic, the VP of Software Development at Hulu, on stage to talk about their first cloud-based service launch. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adrian, for the introduction. It's my pleasure to be here today. It seems like just yesterday, I was attending reInvent and learning about other companies and how they're leveraging the cloud. And yet, here we are today talking about Hulu and our journey into the cloud. Let me start with a little bit of history about Hulu. We started off a little over nine years ago as a free ad-supported video on demand service where you can watch last night's TV shows on the web. Back then, instead of pirating Family Guy, you had the opportunity to watch it on Hulu in your dorm room and then go to sleep with clear conscience. We've come a long way since then. We've launched two subscription video on demand services, one with limited commercials, one with no commercials. We're now available on all major mobile and living room devices. We also added premium content, starting with Showtime, then HBO and Cinemax. And we're also a major player in original content, with shows like Handmaid's Tale, which received 13 Emmy nominations, and just this past week won the TCA Award for Best Program and Best Drama of this year. But we're not just a media company. At our core, we are and always have been a tech company. Practically everything that powers Hulu today, we built from scratch. We manage our own infrastructure and data centers, our own private cloud management systems, build our own video pipelines, subscription and billing, 
ad support infrastructure. Everything you, we have, you name it and we build it. But our mission has always been to redefine TV. And our launch of live TV this past May marked over a year since we started on a journey to build a new Hulu experience. Blending together subscription video on demand, live, DVR, premium content in one seamless, elegant user experience has never been done before. Now, to make that happen, this wasn't just a small rewrite. We have to rebuild our entire tech stack from backend services all the way to every single application. Now, building live TV is really hard, especially when you're trying to do it in a really different way. I'm very proud of our team and how it came together to solve all these challenges and more over the course of past year. I also invite all of you to join us at the reInvent breakout session later this year to take a deeper look into how we actually made it happen. Still, let me highlight just a few of the puzzles that we had to struggle with. Combining a massive VOD library with live stream meant metadata became a huge problem for us. Not having the description or the movie art just right could mean the difference between you actually starting to watch the program you're looking for or skipping right past it, right? Let's talk about the Avengers movie, for example. I'm sure you're thinking about the Marvel one that was highly successful a few years back. But did you know there was another one that was less successful in the late 90s with Uma Thurman and Sean Connery? Did you know there was also the Avengers series on British TV in the 60s? So clearly, just having the stream right is not enough. Having the name, the description, and the right image is all needed to make sure we capture the attention of the viewer. We also knew that to launch live successfully, sports and news are going to be a big deal. Now, we're a national service, and to get the coverage that we needed, we have to ingest over 600 streams, and that includes regional sports networks and local affiliates. Now, just think about it. That's about 20 gigabytes per second of streams coming in. And that number is only growing as we're getting more and more coverage. So needless to say, we didn't want to worry about that type of ingress in our data center. Now, with all these complexities we had to tackle, with a fairly aggressive title deadline, it was important for us to stay laser focused. We didn't want to worry about procuring machines or scaling up network and bandwidth in our data center. We also really didn't know how many subscribers we're going to get or what the viewing patterns and spikes are going to look like, how much of the traffic is going to go to VOD, how much of the traffic is going to go to live. So while we've experimented with cloud before, this became our first large-scale production deployment into the cloud. And I'm happy to say that we've selected AWS to be our partner. Let's talk a little bit about how we did it. First, let me give you sort of a streaming 101 lesson. To make streaming work at a very basic level, you need your video segments, and you need your manifest that tells the player how to put those segments together and what order, where to put ads, and so forth. You get those two things working, and you're ready to stream. For our live service, our live ingest, our packaging, our manifest generation, our DVR and our origin are all in the cloud. To get those 600 streams, we're working with multiple encoding vendors to get the data into AWS in a variety of ways. Once there, we repackage it and normalize it to our flavor of HLS and Dash Live. We apply commercial DRM. We generate manifests on the fly. And once ready, we push it all into S3 origin and then from there into CDNs. That's it. I think you guys are all ready to go and build your own streaming service on the weekend. So all you need to know. Now, in reality, this was a fun ride, and we did have some tricks and turns along the way. Selecting S3 for origin made a lot of sense, and AWS helped us get all the performance we needed out of that. Some of the other areas were not as clear cut. On the manifest generation, we were originally using Redis, and we had to make a very last minute change to find a way to persist manifest more reliably. Now, we worked with AWS very closely, and we were able to re-architect the entire manifest storage portion, base it on top of Aurora, 
launch and debug it all with about a week or so to spare before going live. We also had a multi-CDN strategy for our VOD business, so we really had no plans to use CloudFront. Still, it was very easy to use and cost-effective, and we decided to give it a shot during the private beta. We used it our, as our exclusive CDN for private beta, and we're very pleased with performance characteristics. So now we're using CloudFront along other CDN providers that we have. Now, I don't know if we were lucky or prepared, probably a little bit of both, but our launch in May went very smoothly. And a big part of that is our partnership with AWS to prepare from the operational standpoint and make sure the performance is tuned. AWS folks were there working side by side with our engineers, pre-warming ELBs, monitoring traffic, and making sure we do whatever it takes that, so that the release goes smoothly. Now that we're past that step and we're up and running, they're continuing to work closely with us to make sure we optimize the cost and also find better ways to leverage AWS. Now, all of this is still brand new. We're learning how customers are interacting with this new way of watching TV. Blending VOD with live with, D, uh, with DVR also means that our traffic patterns are going to be different than those of other players in this industry. A good example of that was Game of Thrones premiere just about a month ago. By balancing between VOD and live streams, between our data center and the cloud, we were able to normalize the load on our infrastructure and keep up with, quite frankly, a massive spike in demand. There is still a lot to do, but with our ability to burst into the cloud, we're excited to continue to innovate and make it a better user experience with AWS at our side with other cloud partner. Thank you very much for your time. That was awesome. Um, lots of great learnings there. And you can see a few of the characteristics there, able to get things built really quickly. And then when it comes to a launch, don't know how many customers you're going to have. But it doesn't matter because you can scale to meet whatever you need. And this, this is really what, uh, what, what we're talking about with the, the ability to get to supersonic speed and get customers out. But I'm going to move on now and talk about flight, a different situation. So builders want to be able to fly. But you know, companies want to be able to fly away from some of the constraints and break free from some of the lock-in and some of the uh, some of the relationships that they have. So what we tend to do, what we've, what we've been hearing from our customers is they want the freedom to build things quickly, understand data better, they want to unshackle from their current database vendors, drive costs down, and have good ways to migrate out. And you know, this is kind of the, uh, the world that they're running away from. And what we're finding is people are moving to open source database engines. They're moving to MySQL, Postgres, MariaDB. And we want to have that be the new standard, right? Your SQL, the queries, the schemas, that's what matters. That's what you're really locked into. And you want to be on an open source base there because that gives you the choice. And this is your data. This is something that gets, gets complicated quickly. So we wanted to find ways to help. And we've built a, a really powerful database migration service. And this keeps getting better. We keep adding features to it. But so far, we've migrated over 34,000 databases. You know, I've given this presentation a few times this year. That number goes up in every, every time I give it by a good, good chunk. So it lets you migrate between an on-prem database and an AWS service. It makes you migrate between databases. and We'll do automated schema conversion. And then you can run continuous data replication. This is something back in 2009, back when I was sort of first getting into cloud. This is something that we had to build for ourselves. How do you do continuous replication? Because you, haven't, you don't just flick a switch and stop using the old system when the new one comes up. You have to run side by side for a while to prove everything out, to do the migration. That's, it's a much more gradual uh, migration that happens. So data replication is really important. And what we found, though, was that when you land your, your resources, on, your, your, your databases on MySQL or Postgres, it's kind of like there's, it, you can get a certain amount of performance. We can throw hardware at it, and it it's, works pretty well. But we figured we could do better. 
And we built a new backend for MySQL, and with six-way replication across three availability zones just by default. You don't have to think about it. It's highly available. It's very high performance. And this is the fastest growing AWS service ever. We've launched it a year or two ago, and it's just taken off. It's incredibly powerful. Lots of people are using it. But we had some additional requests that, you know, it's, you can move some bases, migrate to MySQL well, but there's other, others, particularly if you look at Oracle, its schema is, and, and query, model, query models are basically closer to Postgres than they are to MySQL. So we started hearing from people, can you do a Postgres version of this? So we, we announced that at reInvent last year. It's currently an open preview. And again, it behaves roughly the same way. It gives you 10 times the performance, very low cost, and the ability to migrate more of your workloads over. We've got uh, huge customer success with, with Aurora. Um, Expedia is one of the companies I've been uh, spending a bit of time with recently. Uh, they do 300 million writes a day into Aurora. The kind of databases that Expedia tracks will tell you what, how many hotel rooms are available at every hotel in the world now, right? This is going to come in important when you're trying to get your, your reInvent uh, hotel rooms in Las Vegas, by the way. But, um, you know, they're, they're peaking 17,000 writes a second into this database and figuring out how to do it. And we've done a major migration into Aurora with uh, Expedia on that workload. So migration is a journey, and there's a lot of different things to look at here. And I wanted to bring on a customer that's been going through that, um, through that journey. And actually, an old friend of mine from uh, our days uh, a decade or so ago, Klaus Malt, the CIO of Pico. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, and good morning to you all. Um, my name is Klaus Malt. I'm the CIO at FICO. And part of my and my team's responsibility at FICO is to run the cloud services uh, and also to look at what does the future cloud services look at uh, uh, at FICO. So today I'm going to tell you a little bit about what FICO is, what type of company we are, and our journey to the AD AWS and the public cloud. Well, most of you know FICO, at least if you've been living in the US, for the FICO score. The FICO score is used in 90 out of the top 100 uh, lending institutions for the risk assessment needed to evaluate credit. So if you have to apply for a house loan or a car loan or a credit card, you likely have interfaced with the FICO score. But the FICO score is a lot more, uh, or FICO is a lot more than just FICO score. We also have a significant amount of software uh, that we deliver, and it's advanced analytics software. We have delivered that to more than 10,000 customers in more than 100 countries around the globe. Having said that, most of these solutions has been delivered on-prem, and it was not until about four years ago that we started our journey into the cloud, where we created a private cloud uh, with data centers in the US and data centers in Europe to deliver these type of services. What we learned over the last couple of years, because we deliver these software to highly regulated industries, is that our customers in the finance community as well as insurance community is now starting to look to deliver their solutions and hence the offerings that we will deliver in the public cloud. They're all looking at AWS and figuring out how they can deliver that solution. So it's only obvious for us to meet our clients in the cloud and in the public cloud. So uh, delivering these things in the public cloud is obviously very different than delivering it in the private cloud. Um, we, we have done a significant amount of work in order to understand how we can get to the public cloud and the benefits of getting to the public cloud. So, while we're looking at the benefits to go to the public cloud versus our private cloud, it became pretty obvious that it had some significant benefits to us. 
Those benefits that you heard before is obviously cost efficiencies. Uh, we know that we can drive down the cost of our solutions by taking advantage of the services that AWS has to offer. And that is to enable things like scale up and scale down of the services for our customers. We also understand that it's a lot easier to package our solutions, whether that is our shared service solutions a little later, or it is the platform that we built. Uh, we can deliver at velocity that we haven't been able to before in our own private clouds. And then very important for us as well is that AWS has a global presence, and they continue to expand that global presence. We deliver our solutions, and we have to deliver that in a secure, scalable fashion. And the last point here is very important to us as we operate in regulated industries, and that is compliance. What you may not know is that a lot of the services that is being provided by AWS has already been audited and have already got the stamp of compliance in terms of PCI or SAS 70 or SysTrust. And we use those reports, those audits, to extend our own internal products and point to the audits and compliance that AWS is already providing as part of the solutions. So how do we how do we go to the public cloud? Well, obviously, there's a fair amount of planning that needs to go into it. Remember, we are a 61-year-old company. We build a lot of on-prem software. And that software, we used to do a lift and shift into our private cloud. But going to AWS, we had to rethink how these products were built. We had to plan better. We had to look at how the product was constructed and pull out a lot of the common services to build microservices as part of our platform that we now are going to deliver on AWS. And then another piece that's extremely important so we can deliver at the pace that our customers expect us to deliver on is automation and manageability. Using some of the frameworks that's available on AWS, we build a significant amount of automation so we can deploy at a pace we have not been able to do before and also manage the services with the, uh, with the solutions that AWS provides us. Another thing that I believe that Raphael also told us was that we did not do this alone. We had an exceptional account manager that helped bring all the right resources to bear when we built our solutions. Uh, we sat together, we created a plan for all of our products. How do we get to the public cloud with our financial industries, with our financial solutions? And uh, that plan, uh, it became pretty clear since we are an old company, we build a lot of on-prem software, was that we had to reschool or re-educate our internal folks. So we built a curriculum of micro-learnings where we got input all the way from our CEO down to the individual engineers, and we have rolled that out to the complete company. So everybody get a good sense of why we're going to the public cloud and what are the challenges and the benefits with going to the public cloud. So um, we obviously have started executing on the vision. And then what we are, the state that we're now in is that we just continue to enhance and continue to build on what we already have delivered for some of our clients. We use a lot of AWS services. And the next slide is just an eye chart of some of the services that we use for our solution. A lot, as you can imagine, of our software had to be rewritten to take full advantage of the services and continue to understand what new services is being delivered on AWS. Our architecture and the things that we built is very straightforward, I would say. It took time to build it and test it and validate it. What we built is really a common layer of shared services. And these are services that include things like logging, monitoring, access controls, that the operational team really focused on building, building an immutable infrastructure that you basically can uh, deliver in form of an army uh, on AWS. On top of that shared services infrastructure, our development team developed the platform in terms of microservices. So this is where all of our common advanced analytics frameworks is sitting. And then the products itself is being built on top of that framework. It enables us to innovate at a speed we haven't been able to do before. 
and deliver new functionality at a much faster pace uh, that we've been able, able to do before. We actually renew some of these services on a monthly basis. As a result of that, we have migrated some of our, our services to the cloud. Uh, the FICO analytics scores for consumers is all, already running on AWS. Our marketing services is running on AWS. And we are now starting to go live with some of our financial customers. We're just about to go live with a very large financial customer in Australia. And at this, we delivered this particular solution as compared to in our internal cloud, we have seen a 6x performance improvement. And I fully expect that over the next six months, we're going to see 10 to 15 times faster delivery times for the solutions in the financial industry. So with that, uh, I'll just leave you one more thought. We have had a lot of learnings. We learned from a lot of folks that already implemented solutions. We have had a lot of expertise coming to us from AWS. So I'll very much encourage you to learn as much as you possibly can using these sessions and going forward. So I'll leave you with that thought, and thank you very much for your time today. Okay, so there's an awful lot of things to migrate. And yeah, we've seen this from customers. You start off migrating a few things, you know, having Aurora give you uh, five times the performance of the tenth of the price. That'll get a few things moving. Um, but what we see is across our customers, we started to see customers say, well, you know, we have this data center, and it's due for a refresh, or, or the lease is coming to end of life, and we want to we, want, we don't want to renew that lease. We would rather just open an AWS account because that's actually a better data center than what we could build to replace the one we've got. And over the last few years, we've seen more and more people come to AWS and say, we, you know, we're not just moving, our, we're not just building greenfield apps. We're not just moving critical apps. We're clearing out an entire data center. And there's thousands of applications, and there's stuff you don't even know is there. So it's a, it's a big problem. And Customers, you know, we, we started building tools to help you with this. We have an application discovery service. We have various migration programs. We've been building a whole bunch of things. There's a server migration service. We already talked about the database migration service. And then there's all these partners that have specialized solutions for dealing with this. Customers are saying, you know, could we find a way to keep track of all of this? So I want to uh, announce a, a brand new product from AWS available today the AWS Migration Hub. Thank you. It's uh, going to be available later today. And it simplifies and accelerates discovery migration from your data centers to the cloud. As you can see on the, oh, sorry, this button. <laughs> As you can see here, you, you basically start off by discovering your apps. That uses the underlying discovery service that we've built, or you can add them yourself. So what have you got? The inventory. It's really important to know what you have in your data centers and in these systems you're trying to migrate. Once you've assembled that, you're grouping together this database, these instances, these services. This is an application. So it's not just application. It's not just instance by instance or database by database. An application from a customer point of view is a collection of things. So we bundle it together into a collection. Then you figure out what tools are you going to use to migrate that. You set it all up. Then you push the migrate button. It starts the migration. Migration takes time. right? And you're tracking all of these different things. And there could be hundreds of migrations going on at once. And then finally, you want to just be able to track what's happening and are they completing? Are there any errors? Do you have to go back? What have you got to fix? And if you look at the bottom here, you can see all the different services that, uh, that it hooks up. So let's just drill in a little bit and show you what that looks like. Let's say you have a, a time tracking application. It has a few instances. It has a few other things that, it's, that you're uh, working with. And you're using um, some partners, like say Cloud Endure's live migration service or uh, Racimi's Dynacenter. All of those are integrated into the migration hub. And that's our, our starting point. We'll, we're looking to extend this, but that's where we've got to for a first product. You drill in, and you can actually see, you know, this is this tool, all the different tools. SMS here is the server migration service. Uh, Racimi, 
DMS is the database migration service. So you can see what's happening here. And then you can see, this is the tracking page. You can see I'm getting there, my, my, I'm working towards my completing my service, and you've got a little chart of what's happening. Right? So migration hub's available today at no charge. You can use it to track all your migrations to all AWS regions. It is hosted in the US West 2 region in Oregon, but you can use it from that region to track all your migrations. So it's not, this is basically available from, a, from the point of view of actually getting to use it. And I hope those of you migrating entire data centers will take advantage of this and um, you know, just keep track of everything. It'll take, you know, hopefully speed up those migrations and make sure you keep everything on track. All right, that's enough on migrations. Um, I'm going to switch gear a little bit now and talk about X-ray vision. This is the ability to see inside your data and understand your customers and business better through data analytics. And you know, we've got an amazing amount of capabilities here. But I think I'm going to uh, bring on Dr. Matt Wood to, to discuss this with you and talk about what are we doing in analytics and also in artificial intelligence. He's got a, a, some amazing stories to tell. Um, so welcome on stage, please, Matt Wood. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Adrian. So as we were talking about, it's never been cheaper, easier, and more cost effective for customers to be able to pull data from their mobile applications, their web applications, their IoT applications, even their own data centers, and load it up onto AWS. And once it's up there, customers typically want to be able to get some value out of that data. They want to be able to analyze it. They want to be able to compute against it. They want to be able to ask questions and get answers back in a reasonable time. And back in the old world, when we had to live inside the constrained walls of a data center, this was an extremely challenging process. You were stuck with a fixed set of resources unless you wanted to make large capital investments. And so customers' thinking ended up being crammed inside that same box. It ended up being crammed inside the walls of that data center. Instead of asking the questions that were pertinent, and instead of asking the questions that were important for their business, they just started asking questions that they could get away with, given the resources that they have available. But in the cloud, those data center walls, they just disappear. And so customers can start to collect the data that they need, aggregate it at the right level, and ask the questions which are truly important to their data. And over the past 10 years, we've built out probably the largest and broadest set of analytics capabilities available anywhere. Once you've stored your database in our storage data engines or in our database engines, you're able to query it using a very robust and broad set of analytics tools. There's tools like Amazon Athena, which allows you to provide interactive queries against data sat in S3. Amazon Elastic MapReduce, which allows you to build custom applications using Hadoop, Spark, and a myriad of other big data engines. Amazon Redshift with Amazon Redshift Spectrum, which allows you to query very, very large data warehouses. Amazon Elasticsearch, which has really found a niche in real-time analytics, being able to collect and visualize large amounts of data in real time. Or Kinesis Analytics, which can take any real-time stream and apply SQL queries over that stream in real time, even allowing customers to embed machine learning directly inside their stream, and then visualize all of that data and the results of that analysis using Amazon QuickSight, our business intelligence service. And the reason that we provide such a broad set of tools is that a single tool can't do any of these things well. All you end up with is an exercise in constraint. You end up just trying to find the lowest common denominator to try and get some of these things done, meh, just OK. This approach, where we have a broad set of tools, each with a deep set of functionality that can operate at high scale, allows you to find the right tool for the job. You don't see Formula One engineers trying to fix Formula One cars with Swiss Army knives. That's because Swiss Army knives, they're not great at anything. They're OK for some things, but they're not great at anything. And our approach is to find great tools that are a perfect fit for the uh, approaches and the analytics that customers want to run. So we can look inside this and look at some of the different types of queries that customers are running. Amazon Athena is a, an interactive query service that makes it easy to analyze data which is already sitting in S3 using standard SQL. 
So you can store your data just in S3. Any data that you have in CSV or Parquet format today can be queried using Athena. You just write the SQL inside the engine, pass it over to the engine, and the engine will go off and run those queries in an ad hoc fashion and collect back the results. You don't need to move or load any of the data from S3 into the Athena service. You can just run ad hoc queries. And that means that anybody inside your organization, any developer, even any Excel jockeys that know SQL, can start querying the huge amounts of data that you have access to sitting in S3. There's no infrastructure or clusters to matter the hood. This is an entirely serverless environment. You just write the SQL, and it's executed against the data. You get the results back within seconds and you're only going to pay for the queries you run. You don't have to have long or short-term running clusters because there's no infrastructure to manage. Athena, the service, takes care of all of that for you. So Athena is great for ad hoc queries. Elastic MapReduce, on the other hand, is great if you want to run more sophisticated, custom big data applications. And these are typically built using large-scale engines such as Hadoop, Spark, Presto and HBase, all of which are up and running uh, inside Elastic MapReduce. Uh, and we maintain the latest uh, and greatest versions of each of these open source projects. And then you can provision, with just a couple of clicks inside the console, fully customizable clusters at any scale. So if you just want a single instance to run dev test, you get that in a couple of minutes. If you want hundreds or thousands of instances, they're just a click away as well. And you can auto scale those clusters under the hood in order to be able to get the performance that you need. So this allows you to code your own applications and run them against the data that you have either stored in S3 or that you've loaded into tools like HBase. A third type of query that customers are looking to run is data warehousing queries. These are petabyte scale queries that allow data customers to pull data from a lot of different sources. And under the hood, what the data warehousing services such as Redshift do is they organize all of that data in a columnar format, which makes it extraordinarily efficient to be able to run queries against. And that means you can run more complex queries across very, very large aggregated data sets. Um, when we looked at this, uh, we ran a, a TPC, which is the standard uh, benchmarking for big data uh, applications. And we found that Redshift was 20 times faster than the equivalent queries being run in just an ad hoc query service. So if you're running reports over much, much larger data sets, you're going to be able to run 20 times larger queries in the same time frame using Amazon Redshift, which is great for financials and reporting and logistics. So all of these different use cases have a very different set of um, uh, requirements. And building out separable tools which are optimized for those requirements gives you the best possible performance. Inside Redshift, we recently expanded the service to include a new feature that we call Spectrum. And Spectrum allows you to take the best of Redshift, which is the, data, the Redshift engine, and expand those queries, not just against the data which is sat in your data warehouse, but against the data which is also sat in S3. So with Spectrum, you can query S3 di directly or join data which is already held in your data warehouse against data which is also stored in S3. We support all the common formats that you might imagine, like CSV, JSON, ORC, and Parquet. And this allows you to scale your Redshift clusters with the compute requirements independently of the storage requirements. So this is a much more cheaper, more cost-effective way of driving large-scale analytics. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Matt, that sounds great, but what happens to the performance? Um, so we did a benchmark. Uh, we took a relatively complex query, uh, and we ran it against an exabyte data set an exabyte of data. And you'd be surprised how many of our customers, both enterprises and startups, have access to large exabyte scale data sets. So this is a, a complicated um, uh, query. Uh, it's got lots of different tables, uh, both stored lo locally on the data warehouse or back in S3. It's got joins across different elements. Um, and the first thing we did was we ran this benchmark on a Hive cluster uh, on 1,000 nodes. And it took five years to execute. Um, we didn't wait for it to finish. We had to make a little bit of an estimation. Uh, but five years on a 1,000 node cluster. Um, this is a little untenable if you're trying to do your annual reporting. Instead, we took the same data set with the same query, and we ran it against Spectrum. And Spectrum returned the results in 155 seconds. So this is a six-order change. This is a step function change in the speed at which you can query very, very large data sets. And it's a perfect example of why customers are looking for very broad sets of capabilities when they're choosing their platform to run their analytics. 
They don't want to be left with a single tool, which is a Swiss Army knife, that isn't great at anything. They want to be able to choose the tools that are the perfect fit for all of their different workloads, whether it is Athena for ad hoc queries, EMR for their custom big data applications, their data warehousing workloads, which are decoupled storage and compute, uh, or any of the other services that I mentioned. Now, as any data scientist in the audience will tell you, there is a bit of a dirty secret to all of this. And that is that in amongst all of these different services, um, there is a lot of, uh, of donkey work to do. There's a lot of glue that holds all the data in these services together in the form of extract, transform, and load workloads, ETL workloads. These are ubiquitous, and they're extremely tedious. Uh, we estimate they take up to about 75% of data scientists and data warehouse managers' times, just moving data around. So just the sheer process of understanding what data you have available and what composes that data, what is the metadata associated with the data sets inside the silos inside your organization. And then writing the tedious, boilerplate, fiddly code to be able to extract data, transform it somehow, to be able to select columns, change the name, drop other columns, to move it between these different services uh, is time consuming and honestly, it's undifferentiated. Nobody goes to work in the morning and wants to write another ETL script. Also, it's incredibly important that these are done and run repeatedly and reliably and at scale. So if you have an exabyte or a couple of exabytes of data, you want to be able to crunch it, to be able to load it into your data warehouse to run your weekly report, it's really important that that workload runs reliably and on a schedule. It can also be resource intensive, and the resource requirements can be irregular. And what that means in the old world is you have to over-provision. You have to provision typically 10 to 20% above your peak requirement, irrespective of whether you only run this workload once a year. And there's a huge amount of wasted uh, investment and capital that goes into uh, provisioning for peak. So we took a look at this, and if there's one thing that we've learned at AWS, it's that customers look to the platform to try and solve these areas of undifferentiated heavy lifting, areas which are technically challenging, which require large scale, and don't offer any differentiating capabilities to the company that they sit inside. So I'm very pleased today to be able to announce the general availability of a new service, AWS Glue. <laughs> AWS Glue is a fully managed data catalog and ETL service. So let's take a closer look. Inside AWS Glue, you have a fully managed data catalog which holds all the information and metadata about the data that you have available inside your organization. And it will run around and trawl your data with the right permissions to be able to discover and catalog that data automatically and recatalog either on a schedule or when data changes. It can automatically, using this data catalog, generate customizable transformation code uh, in Python, uh, which you can then run just as is, or you can jump in and customize inside an editor or inside a notebook. From there, you can take that code, which is customized, and schedule it to run your ETL jobs monthly, weekly, whenever you want. And the entire system under the hood is entirely serverless. So Glue is going to provision and manage your infrastructure under the hood. There are no servers to call and provision and manage uh, as you go through. And to get started with the workloads, uh, you just need to do three things. The first thing you need to be able to do is to build your data catalog. Here, you can just set up a simple trawler inside the user interface, inside Glue, and it will run around, look into your S3 buckets, and identify the data, the fields, and the types of information, uh, you can see there the big ints and so on, uh, that are stored against that data. And once you've got this incredibly powerful data catalog, you can use that to do all sorts of ETL workloads and to drive a lot of automation so that your engineers can focus on the differentiating pieces of the ETL. The second part is to go ahead and generate and edit those transformations. So you can see here we've got a source database. Uh, we're going to take that source database. We're going to do a quick ETL. We're going to remove a column. And then we're going to load it into S3 in Parquet format, which is exactly the format that Athena can use efficiently to run ad hoc queries. So here, all we have to do is click a couple of buttons. Using the data that we have in the store, we can generate uh, the uh, uh, Python code, which can be customized, and then you can just go ahead and run it. As soon as you have it ready, you can just go ahead and schedule your jobs. Uh, this is by far 
and the most simple UI that I think I've ever shown a, a, an audience of this size, and I'm unapologetic about how easy and simple it is to use. So you can schedule and run your jobs reliably and at scale without managing all the infrastructure under the hood. And we've been very lucky to work with some customers in the private beta for Glue, um, such as News Corp, who are able to take all of their content, and they run that exact workload. They're able to take that content, transform it into parquet format, and load it into a, a search table, which they then use Athena to query. Uh, we have folks like the OLX group, which take their real-time clickstream data and then load it into uh, AWS, do transformations, so they can analyze the clickstream across millions of different customers. My Tomorrow's takes clinical trials data and other medical information and aggregates it for analytics. And OST have been doing a fascinating project with Herman Miller, the furniture company, to produce connected furniture. So this is censored furniture, which is connected to the cloud. Uh, they collect all of the sensor information. Uh, they ETL it uh, using glue. And then they're able to use that sensor information to do automatic uh, ergonomic assessment. Uh, and so they have a machine learning model which sits up on AWS. They transform the data uh, ready for that machine learning model, and then they apply that machine learning model to do automated ergonomic assessment for folks that have Herman Miller connected furniture. So an extremely broad set of use cases from IoT uh, to clickstream information, uh, all the way through to medical information um, uh, and clinical trials information, already up and running with Glue. And this will be available for all customers starting today. So speaking of machine learning and Herman Miller, um, a lot of you are probably aware that machine learning is undergoing something of a renaissance at the moment. Uh, this has uh, kind of tried to happen in a couple of different occasions. Seems to happen every seven or eight years. Um, but it's never really stuck in the past. But the reason that it's starting to stick uh, in this iteration, and I'll talk you through some of the ways that customers are using machine learning on AWS in a second, but the reason that uh, machine learning is really experiencing this renaissance is because the cloud has enabled machine learning and customers to overcome the single largest point of friction, uh, which is almost always around scale. So when you're working with machine learning and training machine learning models, you need tons and tons of data. The more, the merrier. If the more data you put in, the more likely it is that your model is going to be accurate. And when you've got that data, you need to be able to train it at scale, typically using high-end GPUs. And once you've trained those models, you need to be able to infer predictions against them, also at scale, both in the cloud for web and mobile applications, but also at the edge for connected devices or on mobile apps where the latency back to the cloud uh, just doesn't work out or where the device may be operating in a disconnected environment. But the truth is that with AWS, we've been addressing these challenges for customers uh, for over a decade. So we have customers today that have petabytes, if not exabytes of data already stored inside the cloud. And they're aggressively migrating everything out of their data centers up to AWS as quickly as they can. And almost all new data from IoT, mobile, and web applications is being generated in the cloud by default. In terms of training, uh, we have tons of GPUs, which are available with elastic capacity and pre-built images available for very fast uh, uptick, as we'll hear from a customer in a minute. Uh, and we will be making available the new next generation NVIDIA platform, which they call Volta, uh, as the foundation of our next generation general purpose GPU instance when Volta becomes available later this year. In terms of inference, customers are using tons of GPUs and also CPUs. We see customers running inference on serverless, on Lambda models, and we see a lot of inference at the edge. Uh, we have a service called Greengrass that will take code, Lambda functions, models, and deploy them into connected devices securely at the edge. We also provide mobile optimization, optimizations, so you can optimize your model for super fast inference, take advantage of the accelerating hardware on something like the iPhone, and also IoT device optimization, taking advantage of um, coprocessors that may exist down at the edge on connected devices. And the result of this is that we see a ton of machine learning up on AWS today, literally from A through to Z. So everything from Ancestry, who are using machine learning and deep learning to be able to use, process genomic information and build out family trees, all the way through to Zillow, who use machine learning to do house price estimation up on the website. And much like we did in the early days of AWS, where the goal was always to take technology that was traditionally only within reach of a very small number of well-funded organizations 
and then make it broadly distributed, as we've done with databases and compute and storage and analytics, we want to take the exact same approach with machine learning and put this magical technology into the hands of every developer. And we think of this in a number of different tiers. Right at the bottom in the engine yard, uh, particularly around deep learning, we make available GPUs and CPUs, and we optimize a wide variety of deep learning engines, such as MXNet, TensorFlow, CAFE2, PyTorch, CNTK, to run extremely efficiently on AWS. And this allows customers to build arbitrarily sophisticated human-level intelligence up in the cloud, run it in the cloud, but also deliver it down to the edge for edge inference. We have a number of platforms for customers that will custom modeling with traditional machine learning or with deep learning. And for application developers who don't have the deep learning skills or more commonly don't have access to the large amounts of high quality annotated data sets, we make available pre-trained models at the end of an API, which is extremely easy to integrate. So here we have things like Amazon recognition, which performs face and object and scene detection. We have speech services with Amazon Polly, which allows you to take text and turn it into lifelike voice. And we even support chatbots with natural language understanding and automatic speech recognition in a service that we call Amazon Lex. And Amazon Lex is the same underlying technology that we use to power Alexa. And customers have been able to use these technologies to build some miraculous, world-changing systems on AWS. One of my favorites is some work that was done at Stanford with the early detection of diabetic complications. So diabetic blindness is the leading cause of blindness in men in the US between the ages of 21 and 46. And it's preventable in almost all cases if you can catch it early enough. The challenge is that the only way to catch it is to look at images like this. This is a fundoscope. And you're looking for very, very small changes in the blood vessels at the back of the eye, which usually requires a human to look at and review a highly trained human uh, whose maybe uh, use and um, skills are better served elsewhere. So we trained a deep learning model. We took healthy pictures of healthy eyes and unhealthy eyes and trained a, a, a deep learning model that was able to predict um, diabetic complications, which went on to prevention uh, in 90% of cases. We also see uh, regulated workloads using machine learning. Uh, this is a company called Arteris, uh, who has what we believe is the first FDA-approved use of neural networks uh, in medical imaging, uh, in this case looking for tumors in um, uh, MRI. We see a lot of consumer uses of machine learning. Uh, Stitch Flix do some amazing work with machine learning. Uh, they're able to not only use machine learning to predict and understand the styles of their customers, but to channel that to actually generate new styles and new products, which they can then sell to their users. Uh, and they use a, a, a deep learning engine that they call Chainer uh, for developing these algorithms, which runs extremely well on AWS. Wolfram Alpha has a computational knowledge engine, which is a Q&A system, which runs up on AWS. Uh, you can ask this system pretty much anything. So I asked it, uh, who recorded my favorite album, Pet Sounds? And you can see here the system understands that Pet Sounds is an album and that it has an artist associated with it, and so it can give me back the results, the Beach Boys. Uh, and some of you may be familiar with Wolfram Alpha because Wolfram Alpha is what Siri on the iPhone hands off to when Siri doesn't know the answer to a question. So when we're talking about the challenges of handling inference at scale with complicated deep learning models, these are the sorts of systems and this is the sort of scale that you can accomplish today on AWS, and Alpha use Apache MXNet. Another example, Instacart. Instacart is an online grocery delivery service, and they use machine learning you know, routinely across their application. Um, but one of my favorite uh, uh, uses, uh, they use a deep learning framework called Keras, so that when their own employees walk into a grocery store to collect the groceries for their end users, uh, they understand where all the produce is inside that grocery store. And they can use machine learning to choose the most efficient route through the grocery store so that they're picking up the right objects in the right order and the most efficient way to save time when they're running their deliveries, which their customers love and saves a ton of effort for everybody that's actually choosing the groceries. Pinterest run machine learning not just on the back end, but also down on their physical device using TensorFlow. Uh, they're able to perform visual search to be able to identify visually similar pins. So you can draw a bounding box around say, an interesting item inside a pin and be able to start to find related pins uh, which you may want to go uh, uh, purchase. 
Uh, and we also see machine learning happening right on the edge. So this is a startup based in San Francisco and Beijing called Too Simple that has the world's best performing autonomous driving system, which is trained up on AWS in MXNet and runs down on the physical device, which in this case is an entire car. And you can see on the left-hand side here, they're able to achieve very accurate object detection. And they can do that not just during the day, but also at night. And that's a much harder challenge because you've got much less information to work with. And not just object detection, but they're able to do per pixel object segmentation. So here in real time on the device using a deep learning model, they're able to look at every single pixel inside the, uh, inside the video camera and start to identify what is road and what is not road. And this allows them to very quickly identify cars and form object detection, but also to be able to pick up road signs and road markings. And you can pull all of this together into a system that they rather unfortunately call SLAM, <laughs> which provides centimeter accurate positioning of the car in 3D space. So here they're pulling in object detection, they're pulling in the per pixel segmentation, and in real time they're building this heat map of where the objects are and how far away they are actually down on the device. So, whether it is in retail or whether it is in real, real estate, whether it's in robotics or autonomous cars, there's a huge amount of machine learning in production up and running on AWS. And to tell us a little bit more about their journey in use of uh, machine learning, I'd like to welcome Sirkan Kutan, the CTO of ZocDoc, up to the stage. Thanks, Matt. I'm so excited to be here uh, to share our story with you guys, uh, especially in New York, because New York is our hometown. ZocDoc is a New York-based startup. For those of you who don't know ZocDoc, six million patients visit us every month to book doctor appointments. Our goal is to remove friction that we all experience in healthcare as patients uh, using the power of technology. We started out by focusing on the first step in a health, patient's healthcare journey, booking of doctor appointments. It takes a very long time to get in to see the doctor, 24 days US average. At the same time, 30% of that supply, the availability goes to waste because of rescheduling, last minute bookings. Doctors are underutilized. Patients can't get in to see the doctors. Patients, as a result, wait and they get sicker or they just ignore their health condition and they get to ER as a result, which drives up the healthcare cost for all. Let me give you an analogy. The same way uh, these companies like Kayak transformed uh, their respective industries and built a marketplace to take advantage of the efficiencies, ZocDoc is, the doing, ZocDoc is doing the same for healthcare. Does it work? Absolutely. A typical ZocDoc user is able to go in and see a doctor in 24 hours versus 24 days. We started out by focusing on private practices, and our technology was optimized for that use case. But as we gained, cri gained critical mass, we turned our attention to larger health systems. This business transformation required bigger scale and bigger expectations, which are uh, tech stack back in the day just could not handle. Hence, ZocDoc 2.0, our new technical strategy to solve the business transformation needs as well as innovate faster. These were some of the pillars for ZocDoc 2.0. I'll touch on some of them as we go through the presentation. Fast forward 12 months, and I'm happy to report that we're 100% in AWS. I'm especially proud of our team because 12 months ago, we had no prior background or expertise on AWS or the cloud. We chose, choosing the right partner was critical for us. We chose AWS primarily based on our shared principles, customer obsession and rapid innovation. Along the way, aside from migrating to the cloud, we had to ramp up on concepts like infrastructure as code, DevOps, while also figuring out things like compliance and security in the cloud. We went way beyond infrastructure as service. We believe, in, we believe that the real power of the cloud is in platform as a service. It allows us to pick a building block and uh, add it to our architecture, a building block that innovates itself, 
runs for us, manages for us, as well as scales independently. We had a .NET monolith, so a lift and shift just wouldn't cut it. We had to re-architect. We built a container-based microservices model and uh, standardized on three tech stacks, Scala, Node.js, and C Sharp, all running on Linux. Yes, I said C Sharp running on Linux. We uh, probably need a cowboy emoji on this uh, slide. We also had a bunch of undifferentiated heavy lifting, because when we started 10 years ago, a bunch of these cloud-based software as a startup services just didn't exist back in the day. They seem like a no-brainer these days. But we had to eliminate a bunch of the uh, services that we, ha we built ourselves. ZocDoc didn't need to be an expert monitoring mon uh, building monitoring systems or A-B testing systems. We wanted to focus on solving patient and provider problems. And in addition to uh, increasing the scale and sophistication of our security controls, we're in the process of getting to the highest level of security certification that's possible to get in healthcare. A great win for us and our patients and providers. We knew we had to build a robust platform to get to our data liberation goals that we set out for ourselves. Our data was stuck in thousands of relational tables. For those of you who are uh, data scientists or data engineers out there, this, this pyramid should seem familiar. It basically says, in order to get to these advanced level of analytics, you have to first have the right data at hand. And over the past 12 months, we've been able to go from pretty much the base level to the top. And what was most exciting to me was that our data scientists were able to build a bunch of the infrastructure necessary to be able to do this all by themselves using infrastructure as code. We built many data lakes, ETL pipelines. Our data uh, grew exponentially. So what do we do with all this data? We have a number of ML use cases in flight, but I want to touch on one we have running in production today, which is what we call patient-powered search. The healthcare patient experience revolves around clinical, clinical terminology that's basically built for providers. It's hard for patients to understand. Let's say I have blurry eyes. I need to know that an eye doctor is an ophthalmologist. It's hard to say. It's even harder to spell. And forget it if you're an ESL speaker like me. So what do we do? We built a search experience that uses three machine learning models. One is a semantic model that continuously learns, that maps intent to a given specialist. Second one is a multi-arm bandit-based model that populates, that bubbles up top user choices. Third one is the relevancy model that basically tries to find the most relevant doctor to a given patient, given the context. The result is a much improved search experience. And as we say it, you don't need to be a doctor to find a doctor anymore. Deep learning used to be hard. Not anymore. Our team was building a new computer vision-based patient interaction. And their initial model was non-AI based. And so they quickly realized that they needed deep, machine, deep learning. And they were able to set up a GPU-based P2 instance with a deep learning AMI, which means they had all of the hardware and software that they needed, and started training our neural network in just one day. I don't want to even imagine thinking about the complexity of the software as well as the hardware, especially in a data center environment. So what do we get as a result of all this work? We move much faster. Our engineering team is going to deliver three times more in 2017 compared to 2016. And AWS played a critical role in allowing us to shift some of the engineering capacity from infrastructure to product engineering, while allowing our individual product engineers innovate faster and independently. We have a product manager, Anthony Lusby. He sets a high standard. The other day he approached me and he said, Serkan, I've been at ZocDoc for seven years, and I feel like we're now moving at the speed of a tiny startup that I joined working for seven years ago. That's music to a CTO's ears. As I said earlier, we started out by, uh, by focusing on appointment booking, but it's the tip of the iceberg. As patients ourselves, we can all agree that there are many more problems in healthcare that we can solve using the power of technology. At ZocDoc, 
we imagine a world where you don't need to have a PhD to understand your insurance coverage. Or finding a doctor and seeing a doctor doesn't even take 24 hours, it's almost instantaneous. Or your prescriptions are just taken care of for you and they just show up at your door magically. And most importantly, you have one place to deal with all the complexities of healthcare. Thanks to AWS, we're now better positioned than ever on making that future a reality. And of course, we're hiring. Our doors are wide open to people who want to help us build that great healthcare experience that we all deserve. Thank you for listening. Thank you. What a, what a great story. It's uh, always humbling uh, when we get to work with uh, customers like ZocDoc uh, with such an ambitious vision, uh, which is really driving forward healthcare for their, their customers and patients. Uh, and just like ZocDocs and some of the other customers that I've, I've talked about on stage here today um, who are able to use machine learning as a, as a tailwind uh, to really accelerate their mission, um, on AWS, so Amazon is able to use AWS to accelerate our own mission. And Amazon, although while we maybe don't beat our chests about it as much as some other organizations, uh, we routinely use machine learning across our organization and have done for over 20 years. So whether it is fulfillment and logistics, using computer vision systems to uh, decrease the time to onboard new inventory, robotic systems for automated fulfillment, search and discovery on the uh, retail website, uh, people, customers who bought this also bought, uh, I'm sure some of you are familiar with, uh, customers that are uh, you know, improving existing products on behalf of customers, such as using X-Ray on Kindle to be able to look inside text, to be able to identify, uh, use natural language processing to identify characters and trends and how they interact, or define entirely new products, such as Echo, or entirely new experiences, such as Amazon Go, which is our no lines, no checkout convenience store, currently in beta uh, in Seattle. Uh, we also use it routinely at, at AWS. Uh, we use it uh, in our own products, uh, such as Lex. Uh, we build those integrations across products, such as Lex and Connect, so you can have chatbots which answer your call center support calls for you, reduce the burden, and then intelligently route to the right human, uh, or for just capacity planning. And so we've all been able to use AWS to fuel this machine learning tailwind to drive us forwards. Now, when we talk to customers, we hear that securing, securing sensitive data is really job zero for them. It really is the thing that keeps them up at night and that they spend a material amount of time doing. And a big part of that is in identifying and protecting sensitive data that can be you know, very challenging and time consuming. It's typically a very manual process. Some organizations have entire teams of humans who just manually label data so that they understand the classification. It's very time consuming, it can be highly inaccurate, and it can be very, very expensive because of the amount of people that you have to do it and the scale at which you have to do it at. So the volumes of data are increasing all the time, and so labeling and understanding that data can be extremely challenging. And so we want to bring the same tailwind of machine learning to solve this extraordinarily challenging and extraordinarily important um, opportunity for customers. And so today, we're announcing a new service that we call Amazon Macy. <laughs> Amazon Macy allows customers to automatically discover, classify, and protect sensitive data stored in AWS using machine learning. So let's take a quick look into this. So Amazon Macy will automatically discover and classify your data. So inside S3, we'll use natural language processing to look inside the data which is stored in there and then use the context of that information to make a classification as to the risk of that data should it be lost. Using this information, customers can understand where sensitive data is located and how it's accessed inside their environment. So we'll look inside over 800 different file types and classify into 70 different classes, each with an associated risk from low, medium, or high. So we're looking here at things like uh, personally identifiable information, email addresses, uh, uh, addresses, 
uh, uh, social security numbers, driver's license information, credit card information, but also operational information, such as your API keys or your private keys. Understanding where those are stored inside your organization and inside S3 and what the permissions are associated with that is very challenging and time consuming. So we just bring our machine learning models to make that completely automatic on behalf of customers. And then once we've classified that data, we use unsupervised models to automatically monitor for anomalies in access to that data. So we'll perform and understand the baseline, the typical access patterns of all the data inside your S3 organization, inside your S3 buckets. And then we'll use Macy and the classification that we've ascribed to that data to start to look for anomalies of access patterns to that data. And then we'll alert your security team when anomalies are detected. So for example, if you had a, an, HR, a, an HR account for, for someone inside your HR organization, it would be very normal for that account to start accessing information and HR documents on a very routine basis. However, let's say that their password was compromised at some point, and all of a sudden, that same account was used to access data, which it didn't typically look at. Operational data, infrastructure data, keys, those sorts of things. Now, this could be an attack looking to uh, broaden the vector uh, that, they, that they already have. With Macy, you can learn and understand the risk associated with that data and then quickly detect and have automatic alerts as to when the access patterns change. So you can start to gain visibility into globally shared content or content which is stored inside your and shared inside your organization. So you can look inside buckets and you can start to understand where you may have data which perhaps you don't want to be shared that broadly. So you may have an S3 bucket which has public read permissions. Let's say you're running a static website on there. Macy will look inside the content inside that bucket and start to alert you if it sees data inside it which you probably don't want to share. So in this case, we're looking at names, driving license information, social, social, social security numbers, and even credit card numbers which are stored in this public readable bucket. And then you can take immediate remedi remediation to solve for that and remove that data out of that bucket or fix the permissions on the bucket. We're also running these unsupervised models we're looking, which are looking at these access patterns. And inside Macy, you can start to visualize those patterns, the normal boundaries uh, that the predictive model sets for that access. And then, obviously in this case, a huge spike in access which doesn't fit inside that personalized model. And Macy will actually tell you, look, there is, a, a, there is a surprising amount of traffic inside this bucket, and you can slice and dice this time series analysis as you see fit. And this pulling all of these things together allows customers to implement continual compliance. So whether it is PCI information, uh, PCI compliance, uh, HIPAA compliance, or the new D GDPR, which comes into effect March next year, uh, which is an extremely broad uh, and an extremely uh, uh, punitive set of regulations uh, for protecting consumer information. Macy is a GDPR enabling service. Just by switching this service on, which is available for all customers today, you can start to understand, visualize your vulnerabilities, fix those vulnerabilities, and get a continual assessment of your compliance to uh, 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 certifications such as GDPR. So we've been very lucky to work with a series of customers who are already in the private beta for, for, for Macy. Uh, folks like Edmunds, who are doing continual insights uh, into their cloud infrastructure, maintaining their policies and practices. Netflix, who are able to remove a lot of their custom scripts and a lot of the custom engineering that they'd already put into place uh, for securing uh, personally identifiable information. And Autodesk, that pooled all of this information together and viewed it through a single pane of glass uh, on Macy. So Amazon Macy uh, is available uh, for all customers today. And with that, I'd like to hand it back to Adrian. Thanks a lot. OK. Well, wow, that's some great new services there. Hopefully you enjoyed all of the, uh, the artificial intelligence, machine learning, and security combination that we've just announced with Macy. So I'm going to talk about uh, the rest of our security products and give you a couple of updates. We have a few new things here. But what we think about with security, I'll push the right place here, sorry. Um, protecting our customers is top priority. And 
for you, protecting your customers is your top priority as well. And we give you all these capabilities for designing security into your applications. But on top of that, you also need to automate security. You need to make it so you don't have to think about it anymore. It just happens. I just particularly want to point out the, uh, the inspector product. In your continuous integration, continuous development pipeline, you're doing builds of products. You're building, building out your code. Inspector will look for vulnerabilities in that code and it'll continuously update with the latest vulnerabilities. So if you've got, you know, if there's a new um, you know, report of a vulnerability in some package, well, it will f figure out you're using that and alert you for that. So all this kind of uh, automation is really important. We have a broad set of tools. So in networking, we have Shield that automatically does uh, DDoS protection for you. We've got virtual private cloud, so you can organize your applications to have firewall between them and to be on different networks. There's a web application firewall for doing application level uh, control over who can access what on your web, on your web applications. In identity, we have IAM, identity access management, a SAM and active directory migration. But I'm gonna zoom in a little bit on contription and compliance for a while. So encryption, uh, I think let's have a look at server-side encryption first. We have a lot of applications that encrypt data at rest, and you get to have all of the data that's stored on disk encrypted. There's compliance reasons for this, but it's just good hygiene as well. So that's RDS, databases, EMR for Elastic Map Reduce, Glacier Storage Gateway, Redshift S3, EBS, and Snowball and Snowball Edge, the little boxes of disks that we ship around. So all of those give you encryption. And today, we're going to add another service to this list. So I'm like excited to announce that we're going to put Amazon EFS data and have that encrypted at rest. <laughs> this rolls out later today uh, on all of the regions where EFSs are, are currently available. So that's, I think, six out of the uh, current set. So when you create a new file system, you can either say, please encrypt this, and it will make a key for you, and it's all automatic, the metadata and the, the content is encrypted with separate keys. And when you, uh, you can also provide a key for encrypting the data. So that's a, a nice capability, and uh, we're, we've, EFS has been picking up really well. We announced it a little over a year ago, and it's giving people some very flexible file storage capabilities on the network. But the KMS, let's go look at that. We've got the AWS Key Management Service. We've had this for, for a little while. It lets you create and control keys. It's very flexible, very scalable, very easy to use. And we have HSM. And HSM's a product that's been around for a while. I, I remember when, when it first came out. And it, you basically, it works by, it, it's not very cloudy. You kind of have to provision it by saying, I need one of these boxes, it's an appliance. The appliance gets, we pay up front, takes a while, we install it, and then you get to use it. But for, for some highly secure environments, highly regulated environments, it's what we've needed to provide. So that you particularly, if you're doing a data center migration, you have HSMs in your data center, you have to put them somewhere. And they're very specific compliances. So I'd like to announce an upgrade for HSM. Um, major upgrade available later today, again. And this is a complete rewrite of the product. It makes it totally cloudy. Um, <laughs> it's a managed service. There's no manual provisioning. You can get one. You can do it directly. Um, you don't have to provision it. You don't have to back it up. There's no upfront payments. It's pay as you go. So it's really the product that, that you really wanted in this space. So really a major new product. We're going to have the, the previous product is, a, is continues to be available for customers that have it baked into their uh, environments. We're calling that Cloud HSM Classic. But this is, this is the product that, um, you know, that uh, everyone's been looking for. And it's got some, uh, some good, the, the FIPS 140, to level three, this is a, gives it some interesting capabilities for protecting it. The thing is with these secure modules is that your keys are stored in them. And what you're trying to protect against is physical access because the root of trust at some point goes back to a physical thing. 
Level three protects sort of more dynamically against those accesses. Okay, so that's, that's the key management. Let's go look at uh, the compliance side and just get a few updates there. Service catalog, this gives you a way to track all of the applications and services, figure out what, what you, your organization wants to do, how it wants to do it, and everything from VMs, images, servers, software, and databases to complete multi-tier applications. So you can have a catalog of all the things that you want to do and provide that out to your development and operations organizations. Then CloudTrail. CloudTrail is an audit history. It tells you what you've been doing on your account. And, uh, and we also have config, which tells you what configuration you're in and lets you put rules against that so you can track what's happening and uh, look for certain events. So happy to announce later today, CrowdTrail is going to be enabled by default for all customers. It, it's one of those things where you go in, okay, what happened to this account? You're trying to debug something, and you go, did you have CloudTrail turned on? No, I didn't. Damn it. So um, we're just solving that problem. You're going to get seven days of event history, always on, free for all customers. It's just going to be there. That starts later today, so we'll just start accumulating, and then you'll have a seven-day history. If you're already using CloudTrail, nothing will happen to your account. It's what you've already set up. And you can go in and configure CloudTrail if you want more retention or some more specific ways to record your, what's going on in the account. Um, there's an upgraded console if you're an existing user that gives you a few more capabilities. So that's CloudTrail. Um, gives us a nice, uh, just a little update there to make it easier for people. And we've got another small update as well on uh, config. We've got two new config rules uh, that are going to give you new rules for your S3 permissions. So what we have is two rules. One of them says, basically, really, you shouldn't have any writable S3 buckets writable to the world. If you did that, you're some, there's something very bad happening here. So it basically, one rule will just globally look at all your rules and say, nothing should be, writ nothing should be world writable. And the other one, you can tag things, you can have exceptions, but basically, it may, it's for looking for things, what's readable, right? There are times where you want to share S3 out to the world because you're back-ending a service, some static web page. But most of the time, you want these things to be internal. So you can whitelist the stuff that should be out there. And you get notifications um, in the usual way. So we have quite a lot of rules. We're adding to these rules all the time. But I just wanted to uh, point out these new rules that go live today. All right. So Let's just talk a bit about a customer that's, uh, that's really running a re an interestingly large and very secure application uh, suite on AWS, and that's Capital One. They're America's largest digital bank. They're using AWS to innovate securely. They're a, a customer that I spent quite a bit of time with over the last few years, and they're using AWS as a central part of their technology strategy. They're reducing their data center footprint from eight data centers to three by next year, and they are one of the nation's largest banks. They offer credit cards, checking savings accounts, auto loans rewards, and online banking services for consumers and businesses. And they've been using or experimenting with almost every different AWS service and giving us lots of input on what we need to do. What does it take to run a bank on AWS? You know, this is the security models, this is the compliance models, this is how we lay out our networks, all of those things. And going through all of the audits that banks have to go through, figuring out how those audits work. So they've been really helpful and helping us drive uh, many aspects of what, of what we do. So I'd like to thank them and um, just, uh, it's been great working with them as they uh, work with them to securely provision on AWS and also innovate at an incredible rate. So what we're seeing here is organizations that are able to move fast and stay secure. It isn't an either or anymore, it's an and. We get to do both of these things. So just to wrap up, there's one more superpower that we'd like to have. We'd like to be immortal. We'd like to be the companies that are still around in a few years. Right? So, Startups breathing new life into almost every industry, and they're taking on the incumbents and really driving change. 
So I'll just pick out one here, Dollar Shave Cup, launched all in on AWS. They've added 3.2 million subscribers and on pace to top $200 million in sales last year. Airbnb launched in 2008. Over 80 million guests have stayed on Airbnb in over 2 million homes in 190 countries. So these are revolutionizing the industries, that, that, uh, the traditional industries. And then we see enterprises. Digital transformation is key to survival. And one of the, the classic examples here is General Electric. They're the only company left that was on the original S&P 500. And that's because they keep reinventing themselves. And Jeff Emmel, the former CEO, had a great quote. He said, one night you go to bed as a manufacturing company, and the next day you wake up as a software and analytics company. And they've gone through that transition. They're, they're building out software. They're working with us. They're, they're moving a, a large amount of their capacity onto AWS. And again, a great partner for us to work with to decide what is it we need to do, how do we need to do it, and what do we need to, uh, how do we, can we be successful together? So GE is moving 30, closing 30 of its 34 data centers and moving them all to AWS to achieve this. So in conclusion, there's really never been a, good, a, a better time to build. We have a, an accelerating pace of innovation. We're adding new products all the time and new features all the time. Every day, there will be several new things to hear about. Uh, Jeff Barr's off posting his blog post, so we've got quite a few coming out today describing the new announcements uh, by Jeff, by Tara. Uh, go read those, there's a lot more detail. Out in the hub, you'll find out more. There's a security uh, session there where you can go and find many of the people working in this space to ask more questions, get your questions answered, figure out what's going on there. And um, one more thing, so reInvent. Registration's now open, uh, November 27th to December the 1st. It sells out, so if you want to go, get in there, get your registration in, book soon, and get your hotel. We're taking over even more of the Las Vegas Strip this year. That we're sp expanding out more and more hotels, so pack your good walking shoes as well. Um, maybe go see if we can rent some Segways or something. Um, so, in summary, go and build, uh, have a great time, and thank you very much. Yes. Thank you.